what I think a lot of Indigenous people want their writing to do is to carve out space for large feelings, for desires that run counter to the world, to the present, to the past, and to show that there is a whole chorus of us singing one rebellious song. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. We make e-readers and apps, we sell e-books and audiobooks, and we build technology that helps people spend more time reading. One of the best parts of the work we do is that we get to talk with authors about their books as well as the books that shape them as writers and as readers. Welcome to Kobo in Conversation. My guest today is Billy Ray Belcourt. He is a poet whose debut collection, This Wound is a World, won the 2018 Griffin Poetry Prize and was shortlisted or won many other prizes and distinctions. He's also a Rhodes Scholar, a distinguished academic, and he teaches creative writing at the University of British Columbia. His new book, A History of My Brief Body, is a lyrical, intellectual, and deeply personal memoir unlike anything else. Billy Ray Belcourt, welcome to Kobo. Thank you so much for having me. Before we get into a history of my brief body, let's talk a bit about what came before it. And we have a bunch of different tracks that we can follow. There is you, Billy Ray, as poet, as academic, and as memoirist. So yeah, if we had a big spin and win, I would spin it and we could pick one. But let's <laughs> <laughs> let's start with poetry. You launched your career with poetry is the youngest ever winner of the Griffin Poetry Prize for your debut poetry collection, This Wound is a World. When did poetry first start as a form of self-expression for you? So usually I date it to around 2014, 2015. I was 19, 20 in university learning, you know, in my women's studies classes, in my native studies classes, that history wasn't something that we could take for granted, that it was being made anew, and that because of this, there was a lot that I had to deal with in terms of you know, my own emotions. And so writing in my courses in the form of the essay didn't feel totally up to the task of that. And so I found poetry and started writing my own And, you know, I wasn't sure how to exist in the literary world, how to publish. And so I predominantly published a few poems on my website, on my blog, (laughs) my WordPress that I built. And that's actually how the editor at Frontenac House, who published This Wound is the World, got a hold of me and how the book came into being almost, you know, accidentally. And how did that discovery happened. I mean, I, I assume he wasn't just trolling around looking randomly for poetry online. So that must have come from somewhere. Yeah. So the first few poems I published on our website, they did get a lot of circulation for an emerging poet. And I think that is how she ended up seeing it. Uh, you know, she's in Alberta, must have had a friend on Facebook who shared the post. At 17, you moved from the reservation to Edmonton to go to university. Describe that kid to me. What was he working through as as a person when you arrived in the city? Yeah, so I lived both on and off the reserve in a little hamlet adjacent to the reserve, both really small places. Edmonton was the city, you know, as if the only city in the world. (laughs) And it was the only, the U of A was the only University of Alberta was the only university I applied to because I didn't see myself going anywhere else. And when I moved, I had a lot of hope. I had a lot of ambition, though I was very quickly confronted by, um, you know, the largeness of university life, of city life. And in my first semester, I spent every weekend driving home the three and a half hours Northwest to be with my family and, you know, finally finding my footing eventually, you know, amongst peers, amongst other artists and creatives and queer people in Edmonton and falling in love with ideas. I didn't realize until, you know, my second semester of university that I didn't want conventional career, that I wanted to, you know, study ideas and, you know, engage philosophically 
with the world. And, you know, I feel like lucky that I'm now able to do that. Did you come into university already knowing that you wanted to be a writer? No, I, it really didn't crystallize for me until much later, really until I won the Griffin Prize that I, did I think that I could have a writing life. But um, <laughs> that's a that's a good indicator that, this, yeah. that it's a good idea. Yeah. So at first I wanted to be, you know, a lawyer, a teacher, you know, the careers that seemed legible and accessible to me. And then writing sort of elbowed his way into my life near the end of my degree. Tell me about your reading life when you were younger. You know, who were or what were you reading you know, before university kind of got hold of you and then cracked you know, the academic world open? So I don't remember owning too many books until high school. And so in my earlier years, I read the books that we were assigned in school. So I think of the Magic Treehouse series, though I can't remember any particularities about that series. And then in high school, I felt inspired by the books my sister was reading in her Native Studies classes. And I ordered some of them, and one of them being Beatrice Monsignor's In Search of April Raintree, which is a devastating but important book about the child welfare system and, and the place of Indigenous children in it and its relationship to ongoing colonization. And this book really struck me because it was one of the few times in my youth where I became so clearly confronted by the you know fact of colonization and the the first place where i really was given the critical lens to analyze it and you know then that drew me to books like richard van camp's the lesser blessed and maria campbell's half-breed books that i sort of stumbled onto and in, in my own research my own google searching but books that it turns out would really form the foundation of both my reading life and my writing life. This is kind of a good segue into your academic career now as an assistant professor at, at University of British Columbia with a PhD from University of Alberta, a master's from Oxford. Are the poet Billy Ray Belcourt and the professor Dr. Belcourt two separate things or is it all mixed together? I think at this point it's pretty thoroughly mixed together. It's hard to you know, differentiate one from the other to even attempt to do that, I think would, would be impossible. And I try in my teaching to be first and foremost a poet as opposed to say an administrator that I want with my students for us to study together as opposed to simply attempt to impart whatever lessons or strategies or wisdom onto them. But I, I think in my, my writing, it's evident that I do have academic training. And I often see in reviews, when I do see them, notes about how it's clear that, you know, I have a PhD and someone said recently that, you know, they had to, there was a lot they had to reread and had to really nauseate on. And they said, well, of course, because he has a PhD. And it made me think of that one of Toni Morrison's, you know, iconic remarks in an interview with Oprah, when Oprah said that she asked something to the effect of, is it true that people often have to reread your work to get meaning from it? And Toni Morrison says, that my dear is called reading. <laughs> and though I'm nowhere near the genius of Toni Morrison, um, I do take some solace in that definition of reading as rereading and that I, I want folks to feel not necessarily forced to reread, but compelled to or challenged to and that relationship to complex modes of thought definitely emerges out of my graduate training, my training in the discipline of English literature, literary studies. And it is true that a person picking this book up is going to have to do some work to, mm -hmm. to hold on to ideas, to follow them through, and to get 
you know, I'd say to kind of assimilate your rhythms of thought and the way that you choose to lay out the story. Mm -hmm. But what I found interesting was that as the book begins, as a reader, it feels like I'm being prepared for that. And I I usually don't pay much attention, I will confess, to introductions of books. Mm -hmm. But these ones for uh, Mr. My Brief Body do do feel like they had purpose that, that I'm kind of being geared up for the work to come. You know, first, there's an introduction for your grandmother, mm-hmm. and then there's a theoretical note, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and to me, it it felt like the first one, you know, anchors us in your family, mm-hmm. and then the second one grounds us in the theory and the aesthetics and the aspirations of the work. Mm -hmm. And then you launch us into the book. Mm -hmm. Am I overthinking that? Or were you kind of stepping people in? No, that was absolutely what I was endeavoring to do. Oh, totally. So you're (laughs) (laughs) 10 out of 10. Awesome. (laughs) But I think each book bears its own theory of how to read it. Sometimes it's invisible or less explicit. I did want to make it more explicit because I, knowing that the book was being marketed as a memoir, knowing that I would reach a larger audience than I have up until this point, I wanted to essentially reintroduce myself and to say, here is where literature begins for me, as you know, you know, with my kaka, my grandmother in Northern Alberta. And then at the same time, to, to show that there's, you know, there's deep theoretical work happening as well. And that seemed important to me, the latter part, especially because I wanted, you know, to show that there are, you know, Indigenous writers, you know, who do this kind of theorizing and that though we've been, you know, barred from the institutional world of theory for so long that we, you know, we are enacting this, we are philosophers, we are in the world of, of philosophical thought. You end the intro with a red utopia is on the horizon mm-hmm. with a big exclamation mark at the <laughs> end of it. And utopia comes up often in this book. What's the utopia that you're reaching for? Yeah, so I've been inspired by a theorist who my cite often in the book, uh, Jose Esteban Munoz, who passed uh, in the last few years. Uh, But in one of his books, he urges us to think about utopia not as a place we need to get to, but as something that we practice already, that we can see in bits and pieces, that we practice when no one's looking or, you know, in our cohorts of of, of friends and and lovers and students, et cetera, et cetera. And so for me, it's not so much about leaving the present in the name of something else, but, you know, finding those instances that already exist and amplifying them or producing the conditions in which they can flourish. And so for me, utopia as a politics is uh, about what we can do for each other. And I'm reminded of, and I cite this in the book, Claudia Rankin's definition of loneliness as that which we can do for each other. And so I think especially right now you know we need to be we need to be with each other and show up for each other in ways that don't mean immediate proximity and so i've found a lot of a lot of hope in that sentiment as well that you know despite being confronted by the, uh, this world that feels in many ways difficult to exist in that we can still nonetheless begin to practice what we need to get to a place in which we can all flourish and that that flourishing isn't contingent on another suffering. And kind of riding alongside that, you also describe the furtive anti-institutional <laughs> feeling called joy Yeah, and say joy is art, is an, an ethics of resistance. Can you unpack that for me a bit? Yeah, so I wanted to begin with joy and locate it at the center of the book and more broadly at the center of indigenous life today because joy in my mind 
always has inside it a theory of freedom. I think freedom is one of the most joyous facets of human life. And so if we begin from the presupposition that indigenous life is about joy, then we can do away with the older stereotypical narratives that usually haunt indigenous peoples. So the ones about deficiency and disrepair and trauma. And it, you know, if, if we you know, push those out of the way, what opens up to us? And, you know, and as I see it, joy is there. And that sometimes is anti-institutional because institutions of the political sort, of the educational sort, of the journalistic sort, et cetera, have, have for so long condemned us to a particular kind of existence. Again, one that is, is um, not as, as livable as, as joy. And so I wanted to, in the book, to try to get to places that maybe have been neglected or that have been left unsaid or unexamined to even in the, in the introductory letter talk about you know, Mike Hickam's house in Northern Alberta seemed to me um, an important aesthetic and political choice because it relocates, it doesn't simply move the margin to the center, it creates a center of our own. Can you talk a little bit more about that environment? Because that was a very, it seemed like both an evocative and an important scene for you in terms of the creation of a different kind of space. Yeah, so... When I think about my cook, um, I think about how she exists in the world so as to um, enable others joy and to care for others. And she really, you know, takes that task seriously and wants people to live a life of dignity. And so I think in my writing, I want to write in a way that is also about dignity and to include people in a way that does not strip away that dignity. And I think that if we build a literary culture in which we can live dignified lives, then um, you know the world would be better for it. And so I learned all of this from my cook. You also talk about your about your father's home and about the the different kind of space that he created. Yeah, so I was always struck as a kid by the amount of people who were always at my dad's house and that, you know, relatives of all kinds, family, friends, cousins, etc. And that it was at the core of the atmosphere or the environment of his house was not the nuclear family. And, you know, in retrospect, that signals to me a different way of of building a home, of relating to one another, that if we gather not in the name of property or possessorship or even, you know, heteronormativity, then, you know, what is made available to us? And um, in that space, it seemed, as I mentioned in the book, that whatever was, you know, on your shoulders that day would temporarily fall away and that we could laugh together and eat together and watch TV together. And that, you know, was a moment of respite that was deeply important to many people. You talk often about the, in both the creation of spaces where joy is available, about the the fight for beauty. Mm -hmm. One point you write that to be without beauty is an integral component of human life in Canada. Mm -hmm. And that, that feels like a deliberately provocative statement that I'd love to know what that's pointing to for you. Yeah, so a lot of these essays were written in a time of both outrage and what is sometimes called political depression. So when you feel like the modes of political address that are available to you aren't working, that, you know, the particular emotional states that emerge from that realization. And so I wanted to, you know, say something with the force to that might, you know, spur a kind of critical consciousness that could bring into focus some of the paradoxical paradoxical conditions of being in the world right now, where we are being confronted with, you know, the terrors of the past, their afterlife, and also visions for 
moving forward. And so, you know, so much has been done that has, in my opinion, made beauty into a scarcity or, you know, risked beauty in the name of, you know, racism or, or structural violence. And so we need to actually, you know, reinvigorate that beauty. And, it, you know, I don't think we are condemned to a beautyless life. And, you know, rather I want us to live beautiful lives. And part of that means, you know, abolishing all these modes of oppression. This is a book that in a lot of ways has poetics and theory and memoir all distilled together. Mm -hmm. And so what made you decide that from the repertoire of different ways that you could write, that this was the right form for the ideas that you were trying to put forward? Yeah, so I had written two books of poetry by the time this book became something legible. And I had written a number of prose poems and a number of essays. And I realized that they sort of were all grappling with a set of themes, gender, race, sexuality, art, um, politics, and that I needed to speak in the form of the essay so that um, I could speak truthfully and with the force of theory and sociology and memoir, uh, because without them, some things might have been lost, I worried. And I think in the moments in the book when I'm most personal and most vulnerable, that those moments might not have been possible in poetry. Poetry also always entails a degree of invention and obfuscation. And I didn't, you know, want to do those things. Um, and, you know, nonfiction seemed the logical turn for me to take at that point. That desire for directness mm -hmm. was, I understand, also the thing that made you not want to write a novel. It was you wanted to be able to go at these issues much more clearly and kind of without having to present it through metaphor or other, you know, someone else's experiences. Yeah. I worried that there were some things that I couldn't make symbolic or metaphorical, as you say, that some issues either resist or cannot be aestheticized. Um, and, you know, I go, for example, into great detail about the so-called suicide epidemic amongst indigenous communities. And I thought, you know, that there is really only one way to write this story or to write about, you know, this, you know, terrible phenomenon. And it's, you know, in the register of truth telling. And to me, that exists in the space of an essay. I'm someone who hasn't spent a lot of time with contemporary philosophers, especially post-structuralist philosophers, but they all turn up in this book one way or another, you know, Roland Barthes is there, Emmanuel <laughs> Levinas, Foucault, and then the philosophers who cross over into gender and queer studies, like Judith Butler, um, and as you said before, Jose Esteban Munoz. But when they do, it's directly tied to your experience and your life. Mm -hmm. Why was it important that their ideas show up, kind of, you know, compressed together with things that you had experienced very directly? Right. There's one line in a prose poem in the book about Foucault where I say, no one runs to theory unless there is a dirt road in him. And I thought, you know, that the like, theory just made available to me a mode of thinking that changed how it felt to be in a body, to be in the world. Um, and that there was a poetic impulse that resonated from theory that felt deeply uh, attractive and personal to me. And um, to me, theory and poetry are, you know, intersecting city streets. And I found myself at, at the center of at the center of them where they intersected. And I keep a lot of theorists work close to me, uh, if only to be a kind of roadmap or blueprint, you know, anchors to ground myself. And that's, I think, what's happening in a lot of these essays where I'll include a quote from a philosopher or theorist and not really expound upon it, but sort of use it as, you know, part of the body of the work itself to show who has 
shaped my own thinking and whom I keep close to me. And sometimes it almost feels like punctuation, like you're closing off an idea. Yeah. And if you don't believe me, here's Judith Butler. (laughs) 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 Tell me a bit about your practice of writing. You've described creativity as a function of or a derivation of loneliness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I wrote out of despair for the first year of my writing life. That's partly how I wrote This Wound is a World. And then I started writing out of a desire to produce something beautiful and artful. Um, and that, you know, today I'm I'm driven to to make something that, you know, re- resonates in the the vein of the artful and so i i haven't been writing a whole lot lately partly because of how the pandemic has you know altered the theaters of creativity but with my second book a lot of the writing came out of a direct reaction to what was happening in the news what was happening in current events and politics with the various court cases against against men who who killed indigenous teens I, I felt like it was probably my job as both a public intellectual and as a writer a poet to document what was happening especially to try to render a set of feelings and lines of inquiry that weren't you know making their way into mainstream discourse or in mainstream news and so to, you know the the work took on an immediate journalistic pulse. And then with this book, A History of My Brief Body, the writing, actually a lot of it came out of my failed attempts to write an autobiographical novel. And I mentioned that, you know, a few times (laughs) in the memoir Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, I wasn't sure what a 23 or 24 year old could say in the form of the novel that you know could live up to the demands of the form the genre something about you know human experience and emotional life that wasn't you know too individualized and so instead i wrote a memoir (laughs) because you know i i kept thinking about my individual life and it you know it turns out that i hadn't done i hadn't finished looking, you know, examining my own history, my own personal history. And I, but I think now that I've written this book that I've been able to write other things, I am writing fiction and that, you know, I feel like I've little lived life to examine (laughs) anymore. Uh, And that maybe in a few years, having lived more that I will return again to memoir. But in the last couple of interviews that we've done, this idea of youth as a disqualifier pops up fairly often. And it, it seems to be a youth can disqualify almost everything. Like I'm, you know, I haven't lived enough to write a memoir. I haven't right. lived enough to write a novel, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I think sounds to me like, mm-hmm. you know, at a certain point, you know, people just feel like, you know, I'm too young and therefore I shouldn't dot, dot, dot. Totally. But you, in in your case, you found that through this series of essays, you could mm-hmm. get to both those, you know, your your theoretical objectives, your emotional objectives, and kind of your you know, your poetic objectives at the same time. Right. Yeah. And I again, this notion of youth as a disqualifier has come up in a number of interviews I've had upon the book's publication, and I've been saying, you know, that if if we wait to write about our lives, to write autobiographically, there'll be no literature about queer Indigenous life, about, you know, trans Indigenous life, and that we need to write from the thick of our lives because that can have an outward effect that is unquantifiable, that our work is a beacon, that even our grief can be a lighthouse for others like us. And so... Yeah, I chose not to let those let those notions uh, consume me. 
Well, and you're filling a tangible void. I mean, you know, mm. you can certainly go ahead and write queer indigenous middle-aged fiction and nonfiction later. But right now we need voices where there aren't any. They're just mm-hmm. these stories haven't been out. So yeah. So certainly appreciate you not letting the disqualification of not being middle aged <laughs> keep you from doing this. Totally. Were there books that you looked to as you were writing this one? Either in terms of form or in terms of kind of people grappling with the same sorts of issues that you were? One of the books that I took a lot of solace in was Roland Barthes' Morning Diary, which was left unfinished because of his own t- untimely death, but which he wrote in the wake of his mother's death. And sometimes these diary entries are, you know, a couple words, not even full sentences. And the emotional force that he manages to pull off in such tiny spaces felt monumental to me. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. something that, you know, I want to do myself, I write, you know, smaller books. <laughs> and I think that like smallness is not necessarily incompatible with emotional powerfulness. I also was reading Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, which has become like a queer classic, even though it was released, you know, in 2015. A book that, again, uses theory to illuminate lived experience that begins with the body with queer life with queer sex and you know theorizes from there i was also reading this fascinating book and unique book by han kong translated from the korean by deborah smith called the white book and it's this poetry fiction hybrid uh written again in you know, small entries that build up over the course of the book and learning from these books how to essentially defy linearity, to defy chronology, to instead let moments glimmer and produce something bright across the span of a book. As you were in this book, did you have a sense of who you were writing it for or who you hoped would pick it up? So there are a few essays that I knew at the onset of writing them that they would be for other queer indigenous people, especially those that come from reserves and rural communities. So these were the essays in the center of the book that are essentially my like coming of age essays about queer life and experience. The essays near the end of the book that take on a more theoretical voice were in part for a general audience. There's the one essay about how not to talk about Native literature that is predominantly for non-Native people. You know, there's an essay, the essay about my family and my childhood, really for myself and my family. And I thought that having all these different senses of audience did not necessarily like impossibilize the book. And it was an experiment in seeing how many modes of address one could use in a book and what would happen. My last question, which is with two parts, if you could have people come away with one insight or one idea from this book, what's the thing that you hope they bring with them? I think it's the line that you've already quoted, which is joy is art is an ethics of resistance. Because I think that in the end, what I want my writing to do, and I think a lot of Indigenous people want their writing to do is to carve out space for large feelings, for desires that run counter to the world, to the present, to the past, and to show that there is a whole chorus of us singing one rebellious song and that that can pierce through the all the fog of history in the past and you know, really light the way for something better. And then the flip side of that question, if you could have people come away with one emotion or with one feeling, what would you want that to be? I think that I would want it to be the feeling of utopia, which is like not a conventional feeling, but I, you know, I think something that often exists as a, like, un 
definable, like shapeless sensation that is fleeting and I think cannot be larger than that. If there's a spark of that sense that another world is possible in reading my literature, then I think that I've done my job. Billy Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've been speaking with Billy Ray Belcourt. His latest book is A History of My Brief Body. It and the other books we've mentioned here, along with previous episodes of the show, can be found at kobo.com slash conversation. Make sure to catch every conversation by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you listen, and leave us a review because it helps other readers to find us. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj, edited by Kelly Robotham, and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening. This is from the essay called Robert. July 2017. Post-sex fixed in the pale light of an overhead lamp sprawled across my mattress on the floor. You are so emotionless, Robert. It looks as though you're a painting ruled by sentiment. I hope you're capable of such grace so that I too can be. We, two men of no aesthetic significance, engineered beauty from stolen time with our lumbering bodies. All my psyche can hold is the past, present, and future tense of the moment. I lie down beside you, the sheets rustling beneath us as though we've made a forest floor of our yearnings. I want to live a whole human life in this bedroom of wet hands, where, for evenings at a time, the world starts and ends without celebration or remorse. What I know, we aren't running away. The eyes are too hungry for their own good. There is yellow of endless gradations. I want to see you tiptoe into all of them. Beside you, bound together in the same puny blaze, there is little to believe in besides the promise of our infinite luminosity. Dozing off, it occurs to me that if there is a corrective to the problem of my existential loneliness, it is this study of light.